everyone. Um, welcome to the HCI podcast. Um, I am Jessica Powley. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Communication at Utah Valley University. Um, this week on the podcast, we are talking about a holiday from COVID. Can we do it? So really what we're talking about is vacationing and ideas around travel during this time. So we're looking at this, of course, from a communication perspective. This is our area of expertise. What about the messaging that we've heard and been told about travel during this time is affecting our decisions. We're also going to tie this topic into the workplace. So some of you, many of you are employees at companies. You know, has your employer been telling you things about what you can and can't do around travel during this time? So this should be a really great discussion. We're looking forward to having it. Um, and of course, I'm joined by two of my wonderful colleagues, Maria Blevins and Leandra Hernandez, and I will let each of them introduce themselves. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Leandra Hernandez. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Communication as well with these two fabulous women. And I research health communication and media studies, and I'm currently looking at how different outdoor organizations are communicating about COVID with their organizational members and then also their audiences. Hi, my name is Dr. Maria Blevins. I'm an assistant professor at Utah Valley University, and I study how organizations are participants in environmental conflicts. Excellent. So this should be a great conversation today. And to kick us off, I'm going to toss it to Maria. Hi. So uh, it, there is much research that outlines the importance of taking vacations. And American employees are sort of famous for not using up all of their vacation time. Um, but several studies, John Dury and Wallace in 2009 reported that active leisure pursuits such as taking vacation or playing golf, help to um, buffer job stress. Uh, the American Psychological Association came out with a study last year that talked about how vacations relieve stress. Vacations have been found to improve sleep, uh, help your productivity, and decrease heart disease. Uh, it can, McCabe um, found that rest and recuperation from work happens on vacations, that you have these new experiences, that you broaden your horizons, and that you get to experience intercultural communication. And last, Latoy, Choi, and Lynn, and McDermott in 2009 found that it can improve your relationships with family members. And so there is no doubt that vacation is a wonderful thing for human beings. And traditionally, the summer vacation is when people take their holiday. Uh, COVID is really throwing um, some uncertainty into the mix. So I want to introduce you to a communication theory called uncertainty reduction theory. So this theory began as an uh, interpersonal communication theory, and it sort of postulated that the more, uh, the less uncertainty you had about a person, um, the quicker you could um, create a friendship with them or the quicker you would trust them or perhaps the faster you would not trust them. But the less uncertainty you had, um, the more intimacy uh, could, could result. This theory also has been adopted by organizational communication scholars who say that the less uncertainty that employees have in a workplace, um, the more work satisfaction that they have, the more identification they have with, um, with the workplace. And that in organizational communication, we talk about policies and procedures that can be created to help enhance um, uncertainty reduction. So that's why when you start at a new job, you have this orientation and um, folks really sort of let you know about what's going to be expected from you as at the job, as an employee, um, as a team member, what the cultural expectations are. So this idea of uncertainty um, reduction management is having its moment right now because in COVID we are just sort of swimming in an uncertainty soup. And I think that uh, I really wonder if all of those benefits that come from um, taking a vacation might be negated, ne be negated by the uh, massive amounts of uncertainty that uh, are around travel. So I thought of sort of three things that you wanna think about and really consider um, as you're deciding on uh, travel. So the first is your own health, right? Is your travel safe? Where are you going? Is it a hot spot? 
what are you going to do there? Is it mainly outdoor activities or are they inside, right? Uh, it's very agreed upon that bars and restaurants are not a great idea. Are you going to be staying at an Airbnb or at a hotel? And what are the consequences of both of those? So your own health is the first thing you want to consider. The next thing you want to think about is the health of those that you are going to encounter when you travel, right? So are you coming from a big city and you're bringing COVID to a place that has very few cases. So I have a good friend who grew up in Sun Valley, Idaho, and they had one of the most massive outbreaks this spring of anywhere in the country because people that were in big cities that there was COVID outbreaks came to their small town. And um, quite frankly, the, the small hospital and healthcare services were not not totally equipped to handle all of the people that had come. So are you doing a disservice to the communicate community that you're visiting by bringing COVID from another place, um, how are you going to protect the folks that you're interacting with, right? So are you going to make sure that you're wearing a mask? Are you going to make sure that you continue to wash your hands? Um, and how can you be kind to them? So I used to work in the whitewater rafting industry and a friend of mine that is still a guide, I gave him a call and asked him what he thought about he would want people to know as they're traveling to be a customer on a, on a raft at his company. And he said, you know, I just hope people remember that I'm having as much uncertainty as they are. So I'm not only worried about the things I'm always worried about as a raft guide, your safety, having a great time, good lines, being entertaining. I'm also thinking about how do I keep these folks safe and am I safe, right? And they're operating under all of these new rules and regulations. So be thinking about um, the folks that are working at the places that you're going and are you being kind to them? And then the last thing you wanna think about is the health of your coworkers when you get back. So we know of states like Hawaii, right? That have a two week quarantine and it has been in the news that people are being arrested, right? If they get caught snorkeling and they're still supposed to be in their two week quarantine. So when you get back from your vacation, is your workplace willing to let you work from home so you can quarantine yourself after your holiday, right? How is it going to impact the people in your office that you're going to go back and be in close contact with? So I would ask this question to organizations. Have you created a clear vacation policy around COVID? Um, are you going to maybe ask people to do staycations where they don't travel so much? Or are you going to ask people to maybe rent a cabin or go camping instead of going to uh, to a different location. And then um, how flexible are organizations willing to be when folks get back for their holiday? So again, we're just talking about these massive uncertainties that um, individuals that are going on vacation, individuals that are gonna be working at the vacation destination, and the organizations that you work at, are you protecting your coworkers and what does that look like? Yeah. Maria, those points were so spot on and all of the comments you were making about traveling and impacts on local infrastructures reminded me of how several local and national organizations in the climbing and the outdoor world were making the same exact points as early as March, right? So um, for those of you who don't know, I am an outdoor enthusiast as well and I'm also very much into climbing and I remembered seeing several articles roll out that encouraged people to not go to smaller towns like Bishop or Moab specifically for those reasons, right? Because when you have smaller infrastructure, smaller hospitals, and then if individuals weren't taking the proper precautions and then they were traveling, that's when we start seeing the outbreaks roll out, right? So, and also uncertainty soup might be the best thing I've ever heard. So, you know, I've I've also been thinking about this too in the um, in the context within the airline organizations and then also the healthcare providers who are kind of um, working alongside airline providers and news outlets and everyone else to help individuals make decisions about whether or not they should be traveling, right? So um, there are several valuable resources on the CDC website, for example, to assist both airlines and travelers with best flying practices in the age of COVID. So CDC talks a little bit about both pre and post flight measures, including but not limited to hand washing, PPE or personal protective equipment, um, personal distancing to the extent that you can, and then also the importance of constant disinfecting. But what's interesting here is the way in which guidelines um, and the 
framing of these guidelines are reaching consumers and news readers, right? So um, health communication research talks a lot about the ways in which individuals engage in health information seeking online, but that depends on a lot of different factors, including but not limited to your own kind of predisposition to take some level of agency to research this, right? It also presupposes that individuals even know where to look online for health information. And then we also need to be mindful of health literacy and how individuals are able to actually make sense of what they're reading online. So one article from the CNBC, for example, said in early May that responsibility for airline and airport, airport COVID precautions is a game of, quote, hot potato, end quote. And I thought that was the perfect way to describe it because it really does highlight how the mandates and the suggestions are kind of jumping back and forth from everyone, right? Who makes the decisions? Is it the CDC? Is it the NIH? Is it the World Health Organization? Is it the airport or the airlines themselves? And then also, how does that impact the individuals in the airport who are providing services to flyers? Um, so this really does allude to the fact that the authority over these regulations and the responsibility for implementing them is a bit unclear, um, particularly when we're thinking about the role of the mask, which was the topic of our last episode. So in terms of who can actually mandate and implement changes, um, this one article by the CNBC stated that the Department of Homeland Security is tasked for screening outbound passengers and incoming arrivals with guidance from the Department of Health and Human Services and the CDC. But CDC spokesperson Bert Kelly has said that the CDC does not carry out enforcement, but only make recommendations in the interest of public health. So this really reminds me of what happened with the Zika virus a few years ago, right? I mean, of course, they are different in so many ways, but we can see the impact of this on airlines and traveling being very similar. Um, so I've done research in the past on how the CDC and the NIH and the WHO were trying to figure out across the board how to make sense of Zika, how to make sense of who it was impacting, um, particularly for pregnant women or women who were hoping to conceive in the near future. And, you know, we, we talked a little bit about the CDC and their website. The World Health Organization's air travel advice website also has information, but explicitly talks about how pregnant women, individuals traveling with newborns, and those with pre-existing medical conditions should consult with physicians. Now, that's the important phrase, right? Because from a health communication perspective, I think it's easy to forget that physicians, doulas, midwives, healthcare providers across the spectrum are trying to help patients make the most informed decisions that they can while also operating on a not fully formed and constantly evolving body of knowledge as well, right? So um, ultimately, in spite of all of these efforts to create the safest environment possible, the demand for air travel is still down. And a CNBC article by Leslie Josephs detailed some of these changes in processes that will be around for the foreseeable future. So clear plastic bags, reducing of touch points throughout the check-in and security process, required face masks for TSA officers, sneeze guards, and so much more. Um, and again, I hesitate to use the term the new normal, but it really does look like these processes are going to become the new standards for the foreseeable future, especially as airlines and all of our other sorts of governing bodies are trying to make sense of how to handle this. And Jessica is going to do a fantastic job now tying everything together with several really good case studies that I think hit on what Maria and I have just discussed. Definitely. So thank you both for that. Um, I recently reached out to two friends of mine. I want to start with this. Um, two friends who have taken flights to different places. And this, I share this first because then I'm going to share my own experience as I'm planning some travel this summer, which I'm still very uncertain about. So my first friend um, in March, she flew from Saudi Arabia to the United States. Um, I should mention that while she was doing work in Saudi Arabia, she did contract the coronavirus and she had a mild case. So she recovered. Three days later, she was on a flight to return to the U.S. Um, she was told that she was immune, so she was not so concerned about her own health, but she was concerned about carrying the coronavirus to somebody else. So she was taking major precautions um, in that regard. 
she did mention that on her flight from Saudi Arabia to the United States, all of the airline officials um, were wearing masks. A lot of the other passengers were wearing masks. She felt fairly safe. Uh, the same individual took a flight in April, so about a month later, um, from Indiana to Washington State. Now, she told me that this flight in particular was a different experience because she noticed that airline officials were not all wearing masks. Um, a lot of passengers may or may not have been wearing masks. Um, police officers at the airports not wearing masks. Really interesting. Um, she did mention that on her flight back from Washington State, she did see more mask wearing. Okay, so that's one friend. Another friend took a flight in May from Colorado to Alaska. This was a six hour flight. Um, she was flying um, alone as an adult, but with her baby and her toddler. She was told that the middle seat on the flight would be open. And so she had brought along her baby's car seat um, to strap her baby in for, for precaution during the flight. Upon arrival and as she was getting on the plane, it was a full flight and she was told we don't have any space for your baby's car seat. Of course, she was upset. Um, things were rearranged. It worked out, but it was certainly not what she expected. And I think um, that, of course, brought along a lot of distrust, I think, for her airline experience. So all of this I share with you because I it heightens my uncertainty, you know, as Maria was sharing uncertainty reduction theory. Um, these cases do not make me feel very comfortable in planning upcoming travel for the summer. That being said, um, amid these uncertain circumstances, my family and I are considering travel. So we actually have a road trip planned to Colorado at the end of June with my immediate family. We're planning on just spending time together in a condo. And then um, a week later, yes, just one week later, we have a flight purchased to Missouri to spend a week with uh, my in-laws in, at the Lake of the Ozarks. And I am feeling very uncertain about all of this. Um, we have these plans in place. We have communicated with both families that we are not sure that either of these <laughs> vacations will be happening. Um, to complicate things even more so, I'm currently about six months pregnant. And so I do realize my um, state of being is somewhat immunocompromised, um, which makes me feel a little bit more uncomfortable about all of this. Um, so I've talked to my midwife about this, of course, because doctor's advice is super helpful as Leandra was sharing. Um, and she actually said that she wasn't comfortable advising me because the information that we have is changing so drastically on a daily basis. Not only the information about what we know about the virus and how it works, but also um, the information about our status quo in any given community, right? Um, the number of cases, the number of deaths, so on and so forth. So where does that leave me? I'm weighing the factors. Um, I loved Maria's um, recommendation of consider my own health, others' health, and the health of coworkers upon return. I think this is a really holistic approach to considering the safety um, in making travel decisions. Um, as an organizational communication scholar, it makes me think of systems theory because it does have that kind of holistic um, perspective on this virus and our collective community health. Um, but I, you know, I am fairly young. I know that that works in my favor. I am fairly healthy within my pregnancy. I take my precautions. I wear my mask everywhere. So these things I know to be true about myself. I am more concerned about my parents and my in-laws, both in their 60s. Um, is it even possible to guesstimate that with precautions taken, I can avoid bringing the virus to them? Or is it a gross assumption, considering all the facts that we know? Um, this is something that I, I just flip flop back and forth between. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at with this, with the traveling plans that I have for this summer. And I really love how Leandra pointed out who's responsible. We don't really know. I mean, the airlines are operating. There are all of these recommendations in place, but nobody's actually um, providing a clear communicated message to everybody, right? And I think that's something that our culture in the United States has really struggled with, with this public health crisis. So um, what about the workplace and vacations? Let's pull this back to um, the workplace. How does this shake out with employers and employees at different companies? 
Um, in my case, I can quarantine from colleagues for 14 days upon return from my final trip. Um, you know, as a university professor in the summertime, um, I do have a class, but I'm teaching it online and I don't need to be in close contact with my colleagues right now. So that works well. My husband is in the same situation. He's working from home, so quarantine is possible upon return. Um, I wanted to share that the Wall Street Journal had a really solid article. They published, um, this is a little dated, it was in March 12th, and it was titled, The Coronavirus and Your Job, What the Boss Can and Can't Make You Do. Um, and it shares a few important points reviewed by employment lawyers and workplace experts. So while some of these points are certainly murky in nature, here's what experts have to say. So first, um, generally speaking, bosses cannot tell you how to spend your personal time, so they can't tell you to cancel your travel plans. It's not legal. That being said, your employer can cancel your vacation time and ask you to work instead because vacation time is not guaranteed under federal law. So in that way, they do have a hand in your vacation and travel plans. It's not direct, but they, they can exert some power and authority in that case. <clears throat> Additionally, employers are within their rights to ask employees to work remotely. And many of us have been in that case. I think it's a good thing. Um, so if you have traveled recently, your employer could say, you know, you, you were recently out of state or in a different city. We'd like for you to quarantine for a given period of time. And so those are some facts that we know about how this current situation affects our employment. Um, Maria, do you have anything you'd like to add in terms of vacationing and the workplace and how this might affect our experience? Yeah, I mean, I think to uh, reiterate what you said, it's so murky and it, there aren't a lot of policies and procedures that are in place. So I would say that this is one of those moments if we're thinking about a system that you look at you as an individual system member and recall that the goal of vacation is to rejuvenate and and renew. So what is going to make you feel that way? So is it gonna be travel and thinking through flights and thinking through who you might be coming in contact to with? Or um, do you stay at home this year, right? It's it's one year. And so just be thinking about that. Or, you know, even if you don't stay at home, perhaps a camping trip, perhaps an outdoor adventure. Uh, it's I don't know, I just would think about in the scope of your entire life, how are you going to feel rejuvenated at the end of your vacation time? It's it's precious time. So thinking about what's going to feel relaxing to you. Yeah. And I, I think also, too, as as we as patients, right, individuals try and make sense of making decisions about our vacations, um, our clinicians across the spectrum, midwives, doulas, nurses, doctors, are doing all that they can to make sense of this uncertainty soup, right? So um, I think that's also a friendly reminder that empathy will go a long way as we're just constantly working with this ever-evolving sort of virus and how it impacts all of us. Excellent. Well, this was such a great discussion um, focused on uncertainty soup in the midst of uh, vacationing uh, during COVID. Uh, thank you both for joining me in this discussion, and I want to thank everybody who's listening. We hope that you are staying safe and taking care. Bye.